Greetings to all of the love and light of the one infinite creator. My name is Jonathan Tong and I'm facilitator for the Seattle Law of One study group. We can be found on the list of study groups on the LNL research page shown on your screen. We can also be found on Facebook if you search for Seattle Law of One study group. We do meet uh, twice a week on Zoom at the time shown on your screen. You can contact us at the email shown on your screen to get links to join our Tuesday, Saturday sessions or any of these Q&A sessions in the future. You don't have to live in Seattle or anywhere near Seattle to join our Facebook or Zoom sessions. We have folks from all over the country and all over the world. All are welcome to join if they are interested and available. We do also have a YouTube video where we keep videos of previous Q&A sessions with Jim or Austin, Trish and Gary, other folks and friends from the LNO Research Channeling team. If you click on any of those videos, uh, you'll see a list of topics and timestamps under each one and encourage folks to look through there and browse through and see if there is anything of interest to them. Otherwise, uh, today we are blessed once again to be joined by Mr. Jim McCarty for some informal conversations, questions and answers about the law of one and how to live it. How are you doing today, Jim? Doing well, doing well. Good. How's the weather in Kentucky? It's been kind of chilly here lately with highs in the 40s, and today we're supposed to be 59, and then by Monday we're going to be back in the 70s. Wow. Nice. Must be beautiful. Uh, we do have some new folks who are joining us today, and we do have some questions in the chat window, so looking forward to having uh, folks have a chance to ask you some questions and for us, uh, all of us to learn together. Uh, I did have one question that I wanted to ask at the beginning. Maybe not so much a question, but just a note that about five days ago on Monday this week was April 1st, which was the ninth anniversary of uh, Carla's passing into larger life. And um, last year, I remember uh, this session actually happened to fall on April 1st, and we had a wonderful session dedicated to Carla and heard all sorts of wonderful stories and remembrances. And I just wanted to ask if uh, you at this time had any thoughts or reflections you wanted to share with our dear friend Carla? Um, it seems like it's been more than nine years since she's passed into larger life. I don't know why it always, you know, seemed like that. Uh, but it does. Um, I know that she is with various people around the world that uh, she's communicated in different ways to help them out on their spiritual path. And occasionally I do hear from her too, either in a dream or a thought or whatever. So there's still a connection there. Uh, I think there always will be. Uh, I can only imagine. Yeah, such a beautiful thing. I can only imagine how many people she has helped uh, in ways unseen in this incarnation behind the veil. And hopefully we'll get to, to, to see uh, after we have a chance to cross to. Uh, otherwise, I did have one other question for you. Uh, this week in our uh, Zoom group, we were talking about discipline of the personality. It's uh, among all of all the different terms and concepts often used by our friends in the Confederation. That's one I've often had a hard time understanding if for no other reason, it's just a oddly random groups of group of words I've never seen together anywhere else other than here. Would you mind uh, sharing with us what, what does discipline of the personality mean to you? Well, the personality that we bring into this incarnation has certain pre-incarnated goals, you might say. In general, the goal of the third density is to learn how to open your heart in unconditional love and understanding for people around you majority of the time, 51% or more. So one of the ways that uh, we can do that is to uh, use what Ross called the discipline of the personality to look at what happens to us in our everyday life that provides us catalyst. And this catalyst is usually uh, associated with something that is painful, disharmonious, or some sort of suffering. And by being able to balance that with its opposite, using the balancing exercises that the Ra discussed in the sessions four, five, and six, we can be able to see that we are experiencing what we need to experience to become more and more like the one infinite creator, to move along the path of reunification and to achieve our pre-incarnated choices. These balancing exercises then 
help us to see we are more and more the creator because as we go through our life, we experience all kinds of things that have a difficult aspect to them. And usually we do learn from difficulty and suffering that expands our consciousness, it gets our attention. And by using those balancing exercises, we see that we're more of everything around us. Uh, the, the person who behaves poorly, that behaves well, the person who's angry, that's frustrated, that's confused, uh, all of those things are part of us. Uh, also, all of the po positive things, you know, you know, the, the happy, the joy, the the dancer, the poet, the magician. Um, every time we balance something that is positive or negative, and they all have to be balanced, positive and negative seeming, we become that creator, a 360 degree being, by using those balancing exercises and processing our catalyst and growing. So those exercises are what uh, Brock called the discipline of the personality. That is a tool that we use to move forward in our spiritual evolution. And uh, it's something that is usually done on a, in a conscious way. And usually at the end of the day, when you've uh, had a chance to process everything that happened to you and you have time on your hands, on your own in meditation is the time this is usually recommended to do that. Uh, so that uh, there's a, a peaceful atmosphere around you and you can experience whatever you need to without uh, causing anybody else any problem. Thank you. Um, would you say that discipline of the personality is something that is meant for just adepts or something that's meant for anyone who's aware of the process of spiritual evolution? Because it seems Ra have said things that suggested both of those things. I think they're for everybody. And that as you use the discipline of the personality and the balancing exercises, you become more efficient at processing your catalyst. You become what Ra called the adept that is more able to do this. Uh, it's like a juggler juggling and dropping the balls and then finally you juggle enough you don't drop the balls as often but you learn how to juggle by dropping the balls <laughs> and i know because that's the way i learned how to juggle <laughs> <laughs> that's neat are you still able to juggle i can but i don't do it very often so i'm not as good as i used to be <laughs> yeah wow that's funny i did learn how to do it decades ago and i think i was able to juggle three balls for yeah. about 20 seconds. At most. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, Follow-up question on that. Uh, adept cycle, uh, is this something that you use or practice or think about much or not necessarily? No, uh, not, not anymore. I just uh, go through my daily rounds of activities and I don't look to see if I'm on a you know, high point, low point, crossing point or whatever. Um, I think that well, I mentioned at some point that after a while that it isn't necessary to be aware of that, that you know, it's a, a way short. It gives you a tool in the beginning to kind of look at, you know, it's kind of like astrology. It, it gives you an idea about what might be coming up and that maybe you could prepare for it if you think you need to or just take it as it comes. You know? Indeed. Yeah, I, I remember there was some passage where they did liken it to astrology and said it's interesting, but not necessarily all that important. And over time, as you said, the timing doesn't really make that much difference. So it is uh, certainly a fascinating concept, though, for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I do. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you going to say something? No, I'm clearing my throat. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I do see a number of questions in the chat window, so I do want to go ahead straight uh, there. Uh, we've got Edgar first, and then Cash, and then Sue N, and Max, and anyone else, if you have a question to ask, go ahead and start putting it in the chat window, and we'll just go through them in order. Edgar, would you like to unmute your mic and ask your question? Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for inviting me to this beautiful group. It's uh, I've seen your videos on YouTube, and it's very nice to be part of it. Thank you so much. I uh, just have a, a question and it would be more and more like your thoughts, Jim, about this. Uh, uh, do higher densities, are they allowed to have 
second density pets because it's something <laughs> that I've been thinking about for a while and you know and also I could imagine if maybe for densities being so negative they like to have some type of pets that will intimidate you know the ones that they want to intimidate so just want to hear your thoughts about that well actually I don't have a lot of thoughts about it because I don't know if uh, higher densities have pets I hope so I mean, I, I hope I get to see uh, my, my cats that I've had over the years in the higher densities. But I have a hunch that some of them are probably going to be in the third density because they were able to be graduated due to the, uh, the bond of love between us. So actually, I have no idea, you know. That's a great question. Any uh, follow-ups on that, Edgar? No, it's just that I could imagine going to a higher density without my cats or my dogs. <laughs> <be a torture. laughs> yeah. Jonathan? Yes. Question? Um, Aaron, my teacher, um, he was a sixth density uh, spirit channeled through Barbara Rotsky. He had a pet. He had a cat. Oh, nice. Okay. That's so beautiful. the answer is yes. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Cash, did you have a question you'd like to ask? Go ahead and unmute your mic. Yes, thank you so much. Greetings to everybody. Um, so yeah, in 1998, I learned a practice called TM and I paid $600 for it and I practiced it. And about a year and a half, I had this incredible experience. In the past 25 years, that experience has, there's gra gradations of it, if you will. And besides the bliss and joy that I feel when I meditate, um, it has accelerated, so to speak, catalysts. And it's, giving me, it's given me the foresight and the energy, let's say, to balance those. Um, so it's been an incredible experience. Hard to relate to with others because you know, some might think, oh, well, you're so, so haughty, you know, <laughs> to, to, to have all this, but it's a real phenomenon. So my question is, Jim, your opinion, of course, or if the raw material has given any insight on this phenomenon that I experience, which is very tangible for me daily. I'm just curious to see the raw material has, has answered so many questions of mine um, that I could never find answers to. And I just recently, you know, experienced all, all of this material, not, not too long ago. So now we're going to go ahead up. and answer that. Yeah. Do you have yeah. any thoughts? Um, or do you understand the well, question? I believe so. <laughs> if not, I mean, you can ask again. Um, for as long as, uh, Don and Carla had contact with the Confederation of Planets in the service of the infinite creator, for the 12 years before I knew them. And ever since then, the confederations always suggested meditation was the very best way to discover who you are and to find your path through this third density illusion. And I would imagine through the higher ones as well, because when we meditate, we are apparently in contact with the one infinite creator in some fashion that will communicate with us. Most of the time, as Carla said, that communication is in thoughts too deep for words because words can't describe what's happening. I have a hunch that that might be what is going on with you. Everybody has his or her own response and experience in the meditative state. And many times it is uh, an experience that accelerates as time goes on, as you become more proficient with the meditations. So, uh, have I answered your question or do you have follow-up? Just one other follow-up, specifically, specifically about the Kundalini experience that is popular on Earth. Anything to anything that raw material um, discusses about or communicates about the Kundalini experience? Yes, each of the energy centers or chakras in our bodies, uh, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and indigo, violet, have a certain function. And as we are able to open 
and activate each of these energy centers uh, in order, then the prana or the love light of the one infinite creator begins at the red ray of sexual reproduction and survival and then moves on to the orange ray of one-to-one -one interactions, the nature of yourself and your ability to accept yourself at the basic level of your being. And then on into the group energies of the yellow uh, so that you can participate in groups and work together for common goals. And the green ray energy center is opening the heart and unconditional love. And that is where we become able to be harvested or graduated into the fourth density of love and understanding. Now, the Kundalini experience usually is in the higher centers, the blue ray of clear communication and inspiration, the indigo ray of uh, seeing the uh, intelligent energy of the creator, the gateway to intelligent infinity, and then the violet ray, which is the contact with intelligent infinity. So the Kundalini will rise uh, according to how much work you've done in the lower energy centers and will meet the energy that comes down, the, the polaris of the self, the, the creator's energy that is in the violet ray and meet you where you are. And that is where uh, the kundalini can happen. And as I said, usually it's above the green ray and, and, and usually, of course, in the uh, indigo as well. So uh, the kundalini is something that is a path that you travel through your chakras by your own experience and and many times it's by what we were talking about earlier the balancing of the catalyst that comes your way that you're able to open or activate uh, the higher energy centers and do the work of what we're all called the adept it's a great question do you have any follow-ups on that cash no thank you so much and um I appreciate the answer. It's perfect. Thank you. Thank you for your question. That's a great question. Did want to note uh, for Cash or anyone, uh, uh, Ra and Kuo have spoken quite a bit about Kundalini. And if you go to the LNL research homepage, if you look in the upper right hand corner, you'll see a little magnifying glass and a little box that you can use as a search engine. And if you put in Kundalini, uh, it'll show uh, you all the different transcripts of sessions where that has been discussed. Uh, Sue Wen, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Go ahead and uh, unmute your mic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, um, Jim, for meeting us again. Um, we have an online reading group that reads Ra Contact uh, one session a week. And uh, recently we are at session 62. And in that session, Ra has asked you guys to rework, rewalk the circle because there was one uh, word missing, I think. Um, I'm just curious to know, do you remember or know which word was missing when you first walked the circle? Uh, no. <laughs> um, I remember we had to rewalk the circle and then I tripped and kind of stumbled and had to catch myself and that re required that we rewalk the circle and rot said that they enjoyed the humorous aspects of the uh rewalking of the circle <laughs> so ra also mentioned that um is that in later time if you feel you didn't do the circle quite correctly you should repeat it again i just wonder if you can, if you have done that later on there was one time when uh, Carla was not yet in trance and out of her body. We had walked the circle and she felt a presence that she took to be our friend of negative polarity and asked us to walk the circle again because there had to have been some imperfection in order for her to feel that entity. Mm -hmm. I, don't I don't remember what session it was though. Okay. Wow, well, thank you. Thank, thank you for your question. That is a great question, Sue. Thank you for asking. Uh, that session that you were uh, referring to, Jim, where you had to rewalk the circle and you tripped or something, and Ra commented on the humor in it. Was that the one that also involved like blowing air across Carla in some fashion for some reason, which escapes me? That could have been, but 
I don't know for sure. <laughs> Do you remember? Yeah, I think they were happening at all, or what? The there were a couple was. of times where we had to blow breath across from her right side to her left side, and uh, that was to uh, cleanse. I believe one of those times was because uh, as time went on uh, past uh, the second year of the contact, uh, we were having sessions less and less frequently. And we weren't doing the uh, banishing ritual, the lesser pentagram in the raw room as much as we should have been. So the, the room had not been uh, prepared properly. It hasn't been cleansed. And so Ra asked us to uh, do that, to blow the air. Uh, the breath of righteousness is what they called it. So that it would cleanse the room in a way that uh, we had not done ourselves with the ritual. That That's about so my favorite awesome. time when the uh, water guys came and delivered the uh, the water, <laughs> knocking on the door and banging on the door for during the session. Yeah, there was that one. Yeah, which still happens not infrequently, right? Phones ringing or people <laughs> knocking on the door while you're like in, in a session. Well, not Is usually it? now. Uh, yeah. I had the phone turned off and the, the printer turned off too. If you don't turn the printer off, I discovered here in the house, the phone <laughs> can still ring. <laughs> <laughs> I believe I remember that happening in the not too distant past. Yeah. Is it difficult as a channel or maybe for other folks on the channeling team to retune when any sort of disruption happens that requires you to stop the channeling? I can't speak for uh, Gary or Austin or Trish. So I don't know. I don't think that's happened too many times. Uh, we did have uh, our neighbors uh, next door were having their lawn cut by their uh, lawn service and the mower was coming up real close to the window <laughs> and uh, at that time uh, Kathy Beck was channeling and she just couldn't concentrate at all and I can't blame her but I've had you know cats sitting on my lap or getting up and walking around in my lap while I'm channeling and I'm used to that you know but I'm used to cats too so <laughs> Uh, I don't think it's I don't think it's too much of a problem these days because it just doesn't happen anymore. We don't have interruptions. Knock on wood. Yeah. That's amazing to me. I mean, I have a hard time just like sitting in silent meditation to reach that depth of consciousness where you're actually able to channel and not be distracted by noises outside or other people in the room. It's just uh, amazing to me. And, Again, just a source of gratitude to you and all the other folks on the channel team for this gift of service to all of us, to humanity. Uh, Max, did you have a question? And then I see Raquel and Alice and Heather after that. Yes. Hi, my name is Max. I'm happy to be here. I uh, only found about out about LL Research about a year and a half ago, so I'm you know, I'm very happy that you guys are still doing events and stuff. Um, but I might have phrased it wrong in the chat, but I was reading recently, um, they were talking about the etymology of Adonai. Um, and Latwi, uh, I believe Jim was channeling that one, was said that, um, that, yeah, it came from, uh, like a universal solar language, Solix Mal. Um, and I think in passing, it was also mentioned that Hebrew and Sanskrit were both like very pure languages. And I think that's my big question is that if these are like pure languages that are similar to like these extraplanetary kind of things, how does this information get adopted by like entire populations, you know? <laughs> what that, a great question it's such a great question that I don't think I have an answer for it <laughs> I know what Ross said about Hebrew and uh, Sanskrit uh, I mean coming actually from the logos and so I'm wondering was there some adept that was able to channel it or become aware of it I, I really don't know uh, is it part of the DNA of certain uh, races or groups I don't know if that's it either um, but I'm glad that it happened, however it happened, because the, those pure languages, it, I think we get, well, I can only hope and imagine that we can get a better understanding of various concepts, because I don't speak either of those languages, 
I know that our Hebrew translators uh, for the raw contact have had some problems of figuring out exactly what word in the Hebrew language would equate to the English language that's being used in the raw contact. Because for some reason, I think there are only one million words in Hebrew and there's a whole lot more in most languages. Sanskrit, I have no idea about the number and how the number affects uh, concepts and, and translation. So I wish I had a better answer for you. <laughs> Some things I think you cannot describe in words, even if you have an idea about how it happened. What a great question, though. Thank you for asking that, Max. Did you have yeah. any follow ups on that? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I was worried. It's pretty specific. So <laughs> um, I guess something that just came to me um, while you're speaking is um, does Earth's logos have like a name or anything? It is so is it is there a logos of Earth basically? Um, planet Earth has a sub logos, which is our sun. Uh, it's a sub-logos to the uh, lo logos of the Milky Way galaxy. As far as I know, they don't have names, but they don't go through any type of evolution. They are another aspect of the one infinite creator. Each logos it could also be seen as what we know as love. And uh, apparently Jesus saw the uh, creator as love. And uh, what Ra had to say about uh, the logos was that... Uh, the creator for one intelligent infinity uh, became aware of itself and that became uh, free will, decided to know itself. And the way it decided to know itself was to create what we call love or the logos, and then to focus its desire to know itself through the logos or love and create what we see as light, which is uh, photons that are uh, moving at various speeds of rotation and angles of rotation to create what we see as solid matter. So everything we think is solid matter actually has more space within it than it does solidity. Everything in, the, in our universe is created out of light the, through the power of love. Does that answer your question, Max? Or were you yeah. asking perhaps a different question? No, that was great, actually. I, um, I didn't really know exactly what I was asking, but I got a a different answer, which I thought was, you know, I didn't ask that I would have asked if I had. <laughs> I think you know some people I mean. <laughs> have asked at various times whether Earth has a name, a different name in other galaxies or other entities referred to Earth by different name. Terra is one that is used for Earth. I remember one session where they said they actually call Earth in some metaphysical realms by the name Atlantis, because this planet is so much part of the, the energies of Atlantis are so much the energies of this planet, they call it that. I think there was another session where they said they call it sorrows <laughs> because of so many sorrows this planet has in its long history. I don't know. Uh, do, uh, did you have any other thoughts to add on that, Jim? No, nope. next question. Sorry, I didn't have any more. <laughs> That's a great question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Raquel, did you have a question you wanted to ask? I did. Thank you, Jonathan. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Jim. As always, a pleasure for you spending a little part of your day with us. I appreciate it. I have a question. Okay, so like Swen, we're part of the same core group that we meditate. Um, like four days a week and we're part of the Seattle group. So we're all rotating and meditating. We have this hot topic that comes up um, every so often. It's a peaceful hot topic, but it comes up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we have different sides of how we deal with this. So I thought I'd pose it to you to see your um, perspective on it. So after, you know, working on ourselves, working through Catalyst, becoming the best version of ourselves that we can become and, you know, sharing love and light, like I said, getting together, meditating and, doing as much as we can in offering our love and light service to others that way. We then have this um, discussion in the group, are we doing enough? Like, is there, can we do more? Is there more that we can do and offer in offering our service? And one side of the group is like, hey, we're meditating, we're 
working through catalysts. We're doing our best. We're sharing love and light. That's all we can do until the others, you know, realize their own uh, spiritual growth. And then there's the other side of the group that says, yeah, but we can plant seeds and we can, you know, we can do more. There has to be more. Look at raw, you know, raw was spreading love and light, but then they came down here. And then when that didn't work, then they sent Jim and Carla incarnated out here as wanderers, <laughs> to, you know, to like receive the, the message and the information and push it out there more. So what's your perspective? Are we doing enough by just being, you know, meditating together, sharing love and light, and that's it? Or can we really push forward and do more and offer more service? In the way that we don't infringe, of course, but we spread the information somehow, some way. What's your perspective on that? I think that there's always more that we can do. I think that we need to do what we feel is the best that we can do. I think we need to set our intentions and our standards as high as possible and then attempt to meet them in whatever way we can in our daily round of activities. And we may not know what comes our way in a way we'd be of service. A cat might sit in your lap and say, pet me please. <laughs> And uh, so we pat the cat. Yes. Um, and I think that what you are doing is beautiful. And I, I think that your group is doing a great work. And I would suggest you keep on doing that and see what opportunities come your way. I mean, you can talk abstractly about doing more and not have anything particularly in mind. But if you open yourself, open your heart to the possibility that more can happen than when you're out shopping or taking a walk in the neighborhood or meeting with friends at someone's house, maybe some other opportunity will come your way. Uh, if you open yourself to it, just say, uh, may thy will be done through me. Creator, may thy will be done through me today. Uh, and then that intention will probably bring to you what needs to be there. I don't think we can always decide it for ourselves and to put it down intellectually and make a list on a piece of paper or something. I think we just have to be open to the possibilities and then let's see what happens. Thank you. That's beautiful advice, actually, because I believe we all strive to just do more, offer more of ourselves. So it's great that, you know, that we just, if we just allow it to come, it's just that we get so, you know, everybody, we get a little heated sometimes. We're like, no, we can't do more. And the, <laughs> no, just meditate and be the best of you, you know? So we get this little back and forth tug in our groups all the time. And then we just end it with like, well, we're doing our best. <laughs> and then that's it. We just, we say we're doing our best and everybody yeah. retreats, but you're, it's a good idea to just allow it and see what happens, see what else we can offer throughout. Right, right. And I think that the conversation that you're having with your team, back and forth with, you know, differing opinions is a very healthy thing to have because yes. uh, it helps everybody to grow. Uh, when, you know, spiritual seekers get together in groups like that, uh, they all are part uh, pieces of a puzzle and they can all help each other by their suggestions or their thoughts or their experiences. So you know, I just agree. keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. And I have a quick thing to share with you. And I, um, so we all met, like, you know, we are, we're going, um, Josh facilitates, um, a lot of, oh, yeah. he brought us to get, he keeps bringing wanderers together in like different cities, wherever, um, they are. And he meets with them. So we met with him, like at the beginning of March, I didn't know it was like a full moon or whatever, or something was happening with the solar, uh, with astrology that day. However, when, after we had lunch by a nice, beautiful lake, um, all of a sudden it got like tornado style when we were standing in a circle communing a torn like it felt like a tornado was coming like a lot of winds the birds were flying like it looked like we were about to be swept up into like a tornado and then it just went away it was like 10 minutes and then it just went away so i don't know should we look at that as like a sign from the higher being saying hey we recognize wanderers are in a circle communing or I don't, that's how i took it but i don't know if you've ever had an experience like that where you knew that it was like they were like acknowledging the presence of wanderers together. Um, I think that probably all wanderers have things like that happen now and then. Uh, and I, I think that the fact that you felt it was happening because of you all being together, is probably the way it was, you know, your own intuition was just communicating okay. from a deeper part of yourself. Alrighty. Thank you so much, Jim. I appreciate your time. Thank you for your questions. What a great question. What a great sharing, Raquel. Thank you.
Probably a good time to remind folks that um, there are a lot of law of one study groups out there all over the country, all over the world. And um, if anyone watching this is looking for some sort of like-minded group of seekers to join, if you go to the LNO research page, and uh, I believe it's connect uh, in the menu at the top, you'll see the list of study groups and uh, ways to join and would encourage all to do that. Uh, Alice, did you have a question you wanted to ask? And then Heather and then Aram. I do. Thank you, Jim, so much for being with us today. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm fairly new to studying the law of one. Uh, seeking all my life, of course, like all of us, but uh, this has made more sense to me than anything. It just feels more right. Uh, and I'm working hard on uh, balancing. I am so happy to have some kind of guidance about that. But uh, the more I work on this, the more meditation, the more I contemplate all of this, the more catalyst I run into. And it gets to be really intense. And um, I just wonder, you know, balancing, is it always love that balances the difficult things? Or is there more to it? I'm just curious what you have to say about balancing exercises. Well, in general, I think love and acceptance are qualities that can help balance a lot of the catalyst that comes our way. But uh, if you're having a problem with unclear communication with someone and you're not understanding what they're saying or they're, they're getting angry in their communication, I think that what we would balance in that case would be a clear communication. Uh, if you're having trouble with your patience, it's running thin with somebody for some reason, then that impatience that you're experiencing, like Ross said, would be balanced by patience. So everything that happens to us has its opposite. And the opposite part is the part that helps us become more whole, more complete in that particular emotion or experience. And the part that love plays, I think, is sort of like a foundation stone that we build the balancing on. And that is the goal of all of the balancing is to open our hearts and that love and understanding. So uh, I think probably whatever catalyst is coming your way, uh, look to see if there's something besides love, something that might speak more clearly to the particular situation that you're dealing with so that you, you, you deal with it in a, a more, uh, I guess, one-to-one uh, -one or clear situation. So do you have a follow-up? Thank you. I really appreciate that. It helps me consider. And as we all know, when we are in a tornado of emotions, Raquel, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's kind of hard to sort it out because there can yeah. be so many different things that come up yeah. about a situation. Yeah, and I think that uh, just because you know you mentioned that and are aware of that, that we need to be aware of how each situation may have more than one quality that needs to be balanced. And that's why sometimes it's a difficult thing to do is to be able to perceive everything that's going on. It's a great question indeed, Alice, one that I'm sure many, if not all of us can, can relate to. Raquel, did you have a follow-up question? Yeah, it's a quick one. Uh, Jim, would you say that the catalyst is not fully processed if you, if it's not out of your thought, like not in your mind anymore? Because I, I find if you're processing something over and over again, but then like um, it comes back like a week later, does that mean it's not fully balanced and that you need to keep working through it? Is that what that means? I think that's exactly what it means. And uh, a lot of times uh, things that keep coming around again and again are not only just the daily catalyst, uh, random catalyst, but they're probably uh, concerning our pre-incarnated choices 
we all have those choices. We make a certain lessons we want to learn in each incarnation. And uh, that is likely to come around for a while. Um, I have my own, I mentioned that before, experience of anger, anger at myself. And it took me 68 years of work to get through that one. So some catalyst is reincarnated choices meant to last a little bit longer than a year or two. Yes, I noticed. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Raquel. Alice, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, when these things keep coming again and again, uh, I understand the pre-incarnated choice and the patterns to be worked on, but is there, how do we know when we're done with a particular thing? Are we ever done? <laughs> if it doesn't leave some sort of a mark in your mind or your emotions, uh, then you're probably done with it. If you notice it, but it's not too bad, uh, then you're getting done with it. If something that has previously caused problems with you doesn't cause any problem anymore, you're probably done with it. Great question indeed. Uh, we have time for two more questions, one from Heather and then Aram. Heather, would you like to ask a question? Hi, Jim. Uh, thanks so much for uh, answering all our questions today. My question has to do with um, fasting. Um, I, we read in the raw material, he talks about using fasting as a tool to, um, almost like a tool to process catalyst. I was wondering if you had ever used it as a tool or if Carla or Don ever used it. I'm finding it to be pretty intense it's, you know you hit this point probably at about 24 30 hours where you just feel super high vibe so just wondering about your thoughts on that i've used fasting a couple of two or three times i guess in the last few years to remove unwanted thought forms the thoughts that i had about somebody or some experience and i wanted to uh, get rid of that and so I did a three day fast and I believe that it worked. Uh, I didn't have a particular feeling, uh, you know, any high feeling or uh, anything other than the situation had been resolved. And that was what I was looking for. That was what I'd set my attention for. So really what Ra is saying is set the intention of what right. you wanna release. Right. That's your choice because you're the only one that knows what's going on. Love it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a great question, Heather. Thank you. Uh, last question, Aram. Hi, Jim. Hi, Hi Aram. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. Um, okay, so my question is about um, uh, creativity and you know, whether it's a uh, act of service to self or service to others. Um, I have, I have a guess that it it's based on intention, but I'd love to get your thoughts on it. Now, creativity in like, um, you know, like, um, artists, like musicians, painters, oh. sculptors, you know, poets, like when okay. they, you know, sometimes it feels like there, there's, they're, channeling their pure um creator within and other times it sometimes feels like there's a service to self aspect to to what is being created so i i just wonder like you know if it's if it's the intention that is what's important or um i don't know like i i'm just wondering <laughs> yeah I, I think that the intention for whatever we do is the most important thing that's the foundation upon which we build all of our thoughts and words and actions and I personally think, you know, so many artists and uh, uh, whether they're doing sculpturing or painting or music or poetry, I think they are channeling uh, from their guides, from a higher self, from the creator. And that uh, what they have to offer is uh, inspiring and is meant to be inspiring for those who uh, read it or hear it or observe it. And 
And I imagine there could be some negative creativity. Uh, I'm not aware of any of myself, but you know, all things are possible. Um, so, you know, negative entities can use whatever tool there is available on our planet to meet their needs, you know, domination, separation, and control. But I think most uh, creativity is a, a beautiful thing. I think it's uh, a portion of the creative that's shining through the, the effort of the artist. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Great question, Ram. Thank you. Uh, I did actually see there was one more question that just got added not too long ago, and that was from Elaine. Elaine, would you like to go ahead and ask your question? And we will make that the last question today. Oops. Hi, Jim, everyone. Hi. Thanks so much, Jim, for your time. My pleasure. Um, so I read your Camelot journal every day, and I love the section on um, from Carlos, A Book of Days. And I'm, I'm reading it. And um, it has, um, it's been a beautiful experience during my meditation, especially. And I'm just wondering, how did it come about that Carla began channeling Jesus and the Holy Spirit? And, and how did the book come about? It was back in the late 80s, I think 87, 88, and 89, Carla wanted to practice on her tuning and her challenging of entities so she could be a better channel of Quo and Latwi and Hatan and Oxal and all the other confederation entities. So she decided to have a, a little experiment. She'd always been close to the Holy Spirit. Uh, she called the Holy Spirit Holly and uh, she felt that the Holy Spirit was a guide of hers. Mm -hmm. And so uh, every morning we would get together with the tape recorder and just uh, Carla would go through the process of meditating, opening herself to channel, and then uh, the Holy Spirit would uh, make an appearance, let her know that it was there. She would go through a challenging process. Then she thought, well, as long as I have the Holy Spirit here, I shouldn't just you know say hello, goodbye. I should let <laughs> them uh, share a thought for the day. And so uh, we got about 487 of these channelings over that three-year period. And we, we chose uh, 366 of the, the ones we thought were the best and also associated with the day that they uh, are mentioned in the Camelot Journal. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's how it all came about. And uh, I personally think that the channelings from the Holy Spirit are the most inspirational channelings I've ever heard yeah. because every line is yes. inspirational. Ra has a lot of information to offer, and some of it is quite inspirational, but they're very specific. And what the Holy Spirit does is, is channel that from the heart and, yes. and see everything <laughs> as the creator. Every line is full of that. You don't have to wait for it to come around anywhere else, like the way that some what Ra says. That's just my opinion. Well, I'd like to share an experience that I had after I started reading the book. Um, I, I read your journal and uh, the passage from the book before I meditate every morning, mm -hmm. early morning. And um, in one of my meditations, I had an experience with Jesus, <laughs> which, All right. which just <laughs> never, ever <laughs> has happened and is not something that I, I ever really thought about or, you know, um, asked for. And it was amazing and beautiful. And um, so I want to thank you for sharing uh, those passages in your journal. Well, I'm so glad to hear that, that yeah. happened for you. That's beautiful. Yeah. 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 <laughs> thank you. And I'm so glad that you're using it as part of your uh, meditation practice, too. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. What a beautiful question and what a beautiful sharing, uh, Elaine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, and what a wonderful way to uh, end our session. Except for one more thing. And of course, uh, Jim, as you know, uh, we <laughs> like to end our sessions with a little pop quiz just to test your knowledge of pop culture and add a little bit of levity and laughter to <laughs> otherwise serious discussions about principles of metaphysics. Uh, you, of course, have given us uh, great teachings uh, about 
important spiritual principles with lasting value. So we want to return the favor by giving you information about totally meaningless, transient things <laughs> with no value whatsoever. And today we are going to quiz you on memes, a relatively new form of humor on social media. Are you at all familiar with memes? Do you know what memes are? Uh, basically little sayings. Yeah. Yeah, they are ideas that are transmitted from one person to another, somewhat analogous to concept balls used in channeling, only mm -hmm. funnier, I suppose. They're typically uh, image taken from a movie or a TV show, like this picture of Leonardo DiCaprio from the Great Gatsby movie. But it usually is taking that picture out of context, putting it in a different context with a caption or something that makes it funny. The original meme is usually shared widely, uh, and then people usually end up altering it by changing the caption or photoshopping new images in just to add new dimensions. They can be really goofy and lowbrow, or they can be really intellectual and philosophical and so on, as you shall see. So today we're gonna do the pop quiz a little bit differently. Today, I'm just going to hit you with a bunch of different memes, some of the ones that have been most popular in the last 20, 20 years, and just ask you to give your take on it, whether you think they're funny or not, or any other thoughts you have. There are no incorrect answers. Uh, oh, I have good. 14 memes that I can show you, and you'll get one point for however many memes you choose to give your feedback on. And we can stop anytime you feel like you have seen <laughs> enough of them. Are you ready to begin? Uh, okay. Yeah, all right. So, uh, your first one is this one. This uh, is known as the change my mind guy meme. Wildly popular, widely spread. Any thoughts on this? Does this make any sense to you? Is it funny at all to you? Hmm. Um, no, that's not particularly funny. But... Do you know what male privilege is? Is that, are you Well, I'm just uh, not really. I'm just guessing that it's uh, the male dominance theory or factor that's been so much a part of our culture for thousands of years. Indeed. Yeah, it's an expression just used to refer to privileges that males have in our culture that females don't have, like being able to go out alone without worrying about being raped or assaulted or uh, catcalled or whatever. Uh, the original meme was this guy named Stephen Crowder, who is a conservative podcaster. And he I guess he just kind of wanted to troll people by setting up a table like this and trying to invite people to argue with them. It is not really that funny. What's funny is how oh. it has been adapted by people who changed the message to something else. Usually just some sort of goofy <laughs> premise that is sort of true, sort of not true, but just kind of makes it weird like this one. That's weird. Or, <laughs> yeah, or perhaps this one, true, false, I don't know. Uh, anyway, that's how memes work. People just kind of vary them as such. Uh, let's try another one. How about this one? Do you find this one relatable? Do you often get new books while you still have unused books sitting around, unread books sitting around? Uh, no, I have 5,000 books in my library, so I don't need any more books. <laughs> Have you read every book that you've gotten? I haven't read even 1% of them. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have some time to go yet, no, no. <laughs> have and you so, gotten any new books recently? Um, reading new books recently? I haven't read any new ones recently, but there was a, a attendee at one of our public channeling meditations that left me with a book that she had written Chronicles of the Wolf, I think. Oh, interesting. Uh, and uh, considering reading it. This but... particular meme is known as the distracted boyfriend meme. And it is one of the most popular, most widely used meme <laughs> that is often referenced in uh, other memes and widely uh, adaptable uh, as in so... like this one. People just take the original <laughs> picture and just change the captions to give it a different meaning and such. And this one has been used in so many <laughs> different ways. And it is the not the last time you will see this meme to today. Oh, uh, you yeah. think I'm going to see memes somewhere else? <laughs> I don't know. 
<laughs> if you waste your time on the internet like I do, yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. For a lot of people, it's really, uh, it's had some much needed light and <laughs> laughter to our day, to the planet. Okay. Uh, how about this one? What do you make out of this one? <laughs> uh, not Is it much. funny? Do you get it? Yeah. This, uh, <laughs> so, so it's, uh, it's the same thing. You just pay 30 bucks for whatever. Right, right. This is called the Drake posting meme. The picture, uh, person in the picture is Drake. He's actually a very popular Canadian hip hop artist. And I think these pictures were kind of taken from his music video, but they put him this way and added the caption just to make fun of things that we reject or accept that aren't really necessarily <laughs> that different. Yeah, we will pay the price, but we don't want to pay the shipping. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. And again, it's been adapted in so many ways, including using the distracted boyfriend meme or using cats, for <laughs> example. Oh, that's not Chloe. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that one of the great things about memes is they're usually something that people can relate to, especially cat owners. Is this something that you can relate to? Do your cats like have this thing about boxes? Do you oh, like yeah. Try to get fancy beds yeah. or spaces? Well, the, I have a feral cat upstairs that stays in a cat tower similar to that one. And that's the only place I ever see her because she's feral. And, and uh, that's where she feels safe when I come up to feed her and to clean her litter box. And I remember Dandelion liked to get in boxes like that. In fact, I have a picture of him in the refrigerator. I opened the refrigerator door and he crawled into the refrigerator. <laughs> With the door closed? No, it was open. I, was, I couldn't get a picture of him if the door was closed. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, that mm -hmm. seems unexpected. Yeah, cats, for whatever reason, are very, very popular sources of memes. It is as if the internet itself was created for the purpose of sharing cat memes. And I've heard, and I haven't tried it, that if you draw a square on the floor, a cat will go and sit in the middle of it. Now, I know that Bosco here, if I put a piece of paper on the floor, or my, any of my clothes are on the floor, he'll go sit on them. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, the clothes I can understand. The square on the floor of the paper, that is really interesting. Something in the archetypical cat mind, I suppose. Uh, but again, yes, this uh, meme is one that is widely shared and widely adaptable. Uh, and cats, of course. <laughs> that one looks like dandelion. <laughs> <laughs> you have my kitties, my two favorite kitties. Oh, uh, that's after so sweet. Another. Uh, indeed. Indeed. Uh, how about this one? What's your take on this one? <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, well, looks like uh, the car going towards government sliding off the road. I don't know if that says anything about government or their opinion of government, but uh, they were turning off for money and they got government instead. And if they stayed Indeed. on the road, they'd get citizens. <laughs> Indeed. Yes, this is known as the left, left exit 12 meme. Uh, <laughs> I think it came from a YouTube video that just showed the car kind of drifting off a highway into that lane. And then somebody decided to put the exit sign on top to yet another way <laughs> to make fun of our tendency to make bad decisions like this uh, or like this. The, haunted uh, scary movie trope of people for some reason going into haunted houses where they didn't really need to. Uh, or again, <laughs> the distracted boy <laughs> showing its face again in a different way. How about this one? <laughs> I think that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> this is known as the uh, not sure if guy meme. It's a cartoon character. And I don't remember what scene it was taken from, but it's one where they, again, just put the caption to show somebody looking at conflicting ideas or questions of the absurdity of modern life. You used to work in a grocery store, did you not? Like one of your <laughs> first jobs? I was raised in a grocery store. My dad was the manager and my mom uh, did the books and uh, ran the cash register and stocked the shelves. And, uh, when I was in grade school, uh, on Saturday nights, I would go to a movie across the street from the grocery store and then come back over to the store. 
And if they couldn't find me, they knew uh, when boxes, you know, boxes are the way they ship uh, cans and jars of food. And so they had a bunch of boxes up next to where you go out the door because they put gr uh, groceries to customers instead of putting them in sacks. If they had a lot, they put them in boxes. Well, I'd be back under the boxes asleep somewhere. So they, <laughs> they knew where to find me. If they couldn't <laughs> find me anywhere else, I was in the boxes. Oh, that is so funny. So wait a minute. Were you the hard worker or the lazy co-worker in this meeting? Actually, I started working. Uh, my dad managed the grocery store as part of a chain. It was called Jack and Jill. And they were centered in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I was raised in Nebraska. And uh, so I started working at the age of 13. I got my social security card at 13 and I started making a bit of money that way. And I stayed in the business uh, all the way through college. And um, it was assumed that when the, the various supervisors came out for the, I worked in the produce department, that I would go ahead and uh, when I got out of college, I would join the Nash Finch Company, which was a major company in Minneapolis, and start climbing the company ladder. But what happened was I became part of the hippie revolution. And after graduating college, I decided I didn't want to spend the rest of my life making money. I didn't want that to be the focus of my life. So I, I joined Teacher Corps at that time, uh, down to Gainesville, Florida, and became part of uh, working with inner city kids in the low income areas. Wow. Yes, major turning point in life and in the life of humanity for sure. Uh, this is another variation of that. <laughs> I obviously think that's funny. <laughs> yeah, indeed, as do most of us. How about this one? What's your take on this one? This is known as the uh, world's most interesting man meme. It started from a ad campaign by Dos Equis Beer back in the 2000s, featuring this character who was described as the world's most interesting man. And the catchphrase for it was, I don't always drink beer, but when I do, I prefer Dos Equis. So people took that image and then just changed the, the slogan around to something funny. Well, uh, I guess it's funny if he has to uh, keep looking for his favorite song and he only gets the last 10 seconds of it. So he's having to look a long time. Indeed. Uh, and there is other variations of that. Like <laughs> this. Or <laughs> like this. They're often good at just kind of making fun of things and the absurdity of everyday third density life. How about this one? Can you relate to this one? <laughs> Dude, I haven't read a word yet, but I think it's funny looking at the kid. <laughs> uh, song on radio and right when the park. <laughs> Do you listen to music in the car? Do you listen to the radio in the car? Do you listen to anything in the car? No, I, I haven't listened to anything in the car for, for as long as I can remember. Oh, interesting. My, my, I have actually I'm driving Carlos car. It was a it's a Subaru, 2005 Subaru, and I haven't had the radio on for uh, ten or so years since she's passed away. You know, to large July. Wow. Haven't listened. I dance to music before I go to bed. I right. dance a, a fast song and a slow song because I think my body really enjoys it. My mind does too. That's not on the radio though, right? Are you listening to no, CDs Spotify? Or? Oh, Spotify. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I have not picked up on that yet. Uh, so this meme is called the success kid meme. It is a picture <laughs> that was taken of this young lad uh, by his mother who <laughs> shared it like on the internet. And then people just started adding captions to celebrate <laughs> the small victories in life like this. Yeah. Or carrying six bags of groceries in one trip or opening the window to let the fly out. And the fly actually came <laughs> out for a change. I have to open the window here the other day to let a, a turtle dove get out. Uh, and my my deck here, I have a bird feeder, and there's a screen that had got the rip in it. I don't know how it got the rip in, but squirrels can get inside it and then get out. But this turtle dove got caught in there the other day, so I had to get the window open and grab the turtle dove and take it out on the back deck and you know toss it in the air so it could fly away. Wow, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's a beautiful thing. How about this one? Are you a punctual person? Do you ever <laughs> arrive at things late? Uh, no, I, 
I don't, I don't know. I probably have been late some, you know, doctor's appointment or something. Probably not though. Uh, I try to get there on time so I can get everything done and get back home. You strike me as a pretty punctual type person. I have a routine during the day that I go through, you know, and uh, there's a certain amount. I have so much I want to do. I have to allocate a certain amount of time to one thing and another. And so uh, I have that routine and by, uh, I, I know when I'm on schedules, when I finally get done with everything in the yard, I've taken my speed walk and I've done my Camelot journal and I'm ready to post it. And you know, that should happen around 4.30 so that I can get my new Camelot journal and take until 5.30 when I will go downstairs and meditate again and come back upstairs and have a, well, first I'll give Bosco his food and his insulin shots since he has diabetes. I'll go upstairs and give uh, Benny her food and I'll come back down and I'll have my food. And then I'll have my Gaia meditation center back. So I have a, I have a schedule. I have to have a schedule to get everything done. You know? It seems a great spiritual discipline to me because it is focused on spiritual practices. I suppose a discipline of the personality, one could say, perhaps. Yeah. You got time for a couple more memes? Oh, sure. <laughs> All right. How about this one? <laughs> this was the pictures were taken from a Japanese children's television show showing this monkey. And again, like so many memes, they just like took snapshots of certain parts of that uh, video and then put it in an entirely different context. And this is called the awkward look monkey meme to depict the humor of people in awkward situations. That would be an awkward one for sure. <laughs> I would think so. Do you think, I, I don't think I've ever asked you this question. Yeah, uh, would it be fair to assume that Judas and Jesus had made some sort of pre-incarnational pre pre arrangement, agreement to do what happened? I have always thought that was possible because, you know, Ross said there are no mistakes. And part of the process that, Jesus was going through was uh, something had to happen that would take him off the path and get him on the cross. And Judas may have been that part of the puzzle. Who knows? It does seem that way. Indeed. Uh, let's see. And again, there are many variations of this meme, all describing awkward situations like someone getting in trouble for something that you did. Or when you accidentally wrote Dear Satan instead of Dear Santa. And <laughs> got everything <laughs> Dark uh, humors. Santa, Santa ought, to, ought to have a good sense of humor. I would hope so. He works hard enough for sure. Uh, let's see. How about this one? This is known as the disappointed cricket fan meme. Again, it's just taken a still shot of a video of a guy, Pakistani guy, who apparently was disappointed at the outcome of a cricket match. And then people have just added captions to it. To make it fun. <laughs> there is this version. Well, that is a funny caption for sure. <laughs> there is also this one, if you're familiar with the five second rule. Uh, no, I'm not. Five second rule is something that I think so many people have heard as kids, where if you drop food on the floor, oh, you can eat it. <laughs> If you eat it in less than five seconds, it's okay. It's safe for whatever reason. So, yeah, well, I'd say it depends on what it landed in. <laughs> yeah, I think so. If it was wet or if it was dry, there's lots of different. Things. And if you have cats in your house, Bosco tracks kitty litter all over the house. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, I had not thought of that. Yes, there is this one, and then yes, there are people who like to Photoshop the image to make another variation of it. <laughs> in that case. You can tell this is what I spend a lot of my time doing when I'm not like doing great spiritual work. How about this one? Can you relate to this one? Oh yeah, yeah. This is known as the evil Kermit meme, just making fun of the little voices in our heads that try to get us to do things that we probably shouldn't do. Now isn't the one on the right with the hood over it trying to be uh, the gremlin or uh, star wars 
I think so. I think so. I believe from my him, research, yeah. this was another still shot taken from a Muppet movie where yeah. the character on the right is actually supposed to be like Kermit's lookalike from some other country or something. But in this picture, I think it's used to represent like yeah. the dark side, the evil Kermit trying to get him to do stuff he shouldn't do. Like getting another cat, for example, or kicking the ice under the fridge rather than <laughs> picking it up when you chop it on the floor. Uh, there is also this one. Are you familiar with the skeptical third world kid me? Again, often used to make fun of the idea of driving to the gym just so you can walk on the treadmill. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. are still pretty diligent about doing physical exercises every day yeah. In addition to your, I take a, I take a speed walk every every day, you know, it's a mile and a quarter, and I, I do stretching and I lift weights and, like I said, I dance in the evening. Wow! And you've always done that since you were very athletic doing sports in high school. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's amazing. Yes, I think I see the power you're you're part of the power in the trio of love wisdom and power that i'll refer to uh this meme again of course is adapted widely <laughs> to i like to look on the little boy's face <laughs> yeah, yeah. very seem to be. questioning <laughs> yes does seem to be very say that again <laughs> yes you want me to do what <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly yes that is exactly the gist of the caption uh let's see i got two more i got two more how about uh this one this one is a somewhat more philosophical uh, meme with oh yeah really yeah that speaks volumes what do you think uh Ra would say about this or quote it's uh Everyone has a unique point of view. They can see two or three seekers can look at one picture and have three different reactions to it. Indeed. Yeah, originally, I believe it was a cartoon by a Brazilian cartoonist who had the caption, uh, if I try to read it in Portuguese, I'm sure I'm going to be butchering it, but the English translation was, sometimes it just depends on us which I think kind of speaks to the idea that we're co-creators of reality and yeah. reality is what we choose to make out of it or see. I have one more for you, and this is a Star Wars meme. Am I assuming correctly that you've never seen any of the Star Wars movies? Oh, years ago, I saw the Star Wars movies, yeah. Oh, how many did you see? There's like nine of them all together, I think. Uh, probably just the first couple. I think even... Uh... Don asked something about one of the Star Wars, and the, the answer was that they're uh, a step down version of reality. Or, um, I could imagine that. Yeah. There certainly do seem to be a lot of law of one principles in there involving empire and confederation, yeah. involving light side and the dark side, two different sides of nature. This meme was taken from one of those Star Wars movies where the character on the left is actually a young version of the person who becomes Darth Vader. And uh, Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. The woman on the right is the one who ends up marrying him and ends up having a, a, a child. Um, and they are having... It turned out to be Luke Skywalker. <laughs> I can't remember. I'm embarrassed to say I was not actually a big fan of the Star Wars movies. I'm probably a bigger fan of this meme, which has been widely mm -hmm. used and adapted in so many different ways. But in this case, yeah, it takes on a different meaning when the person says he's going to change the world. And the person on the right is assuming that it's for the better. And that's <laughs> not necessarily the case. But unlike today, you have definitely changed the world for the better for being here, Mr. Jim McCarty, and appreciate your generosity of time and spirit in being here. Uh, did you have any last thoughts, reflections you wanted to share before we say goodbye? Well, I had a lot of fun today. <laughs> uh, the questions are always good, and they were, they were good again today. And uh, I know they're really good when I can't answer some of them. But having fun is an important part of my spiritual journey. And you're all an important part of my spiritual journey today because you helped me have fun. And I hope you had fun too. 
we did indeed. Love you much, my friend, and, and glad that you have as much fun with these as, as we do. Uh, thank you, as always, for all you've done and continue to do in service to others. Thank you all to our friends at uh, LNL Research for all they have done and continue to do in service to others. Thank you for everyone who joined us on the Zoom call. You really made it special with your questions and um, just your presence, your vibrations have, have made this uh, a great gathering of souls. Thank you for all you've done and continue to do in service to others. Thank you for everyone watching this on YouTube and anyone who's still watching on YouTube at this point. Thank you for all you've done and continue to do in service to others. Until next time, in the love and light of the one infinite creator. Adonai. Namaste. Adonai. Love you all. Till next Adonai. time. Bye, Jim. Love you, Jim. Love you, too.